I'm Mark Rees and welcome to my curious ghosts and folklore podcast where in each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject and to start this episode I would like you all to join me in raising a glass in the air and saying cheers yechida because this episode is dedicated to beer the folklore and the myths and the legends surrounding Wales's national drink and this is a journey which will take us back through the centuries when beer first began life in the cauldron of a legendary witch. Well, maybe. But we will also look at its more recent use in funerals, where drinking beer became much more gothic and macabre. And to illustrate that point, I would like to introduce you to an old Welsh language saying, which would be spoken over a dead body at a funeral. And how's that for a cheerful way to kick off a podcast with a proverb which was spoken over the dead body at a funeral? Now, we've already started this episode with a little bit of Welsh language, and that was Yechid Da, two Welsh words which I think, even if your knowledge of Welsh is next to nothing, It's one of the first little sayings that people tend to pick up on. A bit like Nostra, which means good night, between hoffy coffee, I like coffee, and Yechida. Yechida is the Welsh equivalent of saying cheers or prost in Germany or bottoms up in, I I, I don't know where that came from, England probably, bottoms up, or salu or chin chin. All of these these wonderful sayings when we raise our glasses in celebration. In Welsh, the equivalent is yechid da, which is often pronounced yeki da by people who, who haven't got their tongues around the correct pronunciation of the Welsh alphabet. But that is spelt I-E-C-H or ch in Welsh, Y-D, yechid, and da is D-A, da. And that translates literally as good health. Yechid is health, da is good. So if nothing else, after listening to this episode, never mind all the witches and the dead bodies and all the weird gothic stuff, you will now be able to toast people in the Welsh language or just wish them good health. But that was the easier part of our brief Welsh language lesson at the start of this episode. The next one is going to take a little bit more explaining and it's a little bit darker because we are not wishing somebody good health because they are already dead. This is a toast over a dead body. And I guess that means in future, if anyone ever says to you over my dead body, well, you now have or you will soon have the perfect comeback. Anyway, on with the proverb. And I'll say this in Welsh first and then I will translate it into English. And it goes like this. Clathi amaru ak at akuru. So that was clathi amaru ak at akuru which means to bury the dead and to the beer. Now, I don't know exactly when this originates from, but I do know it was still in practice late in the 19th century when it was recorded. And it puts a different perspective, I think, on this whole idea of funerals as these big somber affairs where everyone is dressed in black and looking down and bawling their eyes out in tears. Well, this suggests that, yes, it it was a very sad occasion, but at the same time, it was a way for people to, to get together in this way. And what I'd like to do is to read a quote to you from the Cardiff Weekly Mail. And they wrote, Before the funeral procession started for the church, the nearest friends and relatives would congregate around the corpse to wail 
and weep their loss, while the rest of the company would be in an adjoining room drinking warm beer and smoking their pipes, and the women in still another room drinking tea together. And certainly, as we know from that saying, there was more than a pint or two of beer going round. So much so, in fact, that, and I'm going to quote my old folkloric friend Wirt Sykes here, but he writes that, occasionally, it leads to appearances in the police court on the part of the injudicious mourners. So these mourners liked having a beer so much that they got up to, well, I, I don't know it specifically, but they got up to things which displeased the police. Let's, uh, let's put it that way. Now, that's the part that beer played in the funeral when it came to the friends and family. But there would also be a chance for other members of the community, the poorer members, as they are described, to offer their services in memory of the deceased and to have some food and a sip of beer in return. As mentioned, the friends and family would get together in the house before the funeral procession headed off to the church. The men would be smoking and drinking and the women would be drinking tea. And it was said that after taking the coffin out of the house and placing it on a beer near the door, that that's not that's a funeral beer there, not not a pint of beer. They don't they don't place the body on beer. The Welsh love their beer, but not to the point where they soak they soak the dead in the stuff. Um, but uh, it was formerly customary for one of the relatives of the deceased to distribute bread and cheese to the poor, and they would hand this bread and cheese to them over the coffin. That was an important part of it. They would hand them this food over the coffin. So before heading off to the church to put them in the ground, food in, in the shape of bread and cheese usually were handed out over the coffin to the poorer members of the community. And in exchange, as it were, they would gather flowers and herbs beforehand and they would place them onto the coffin to decorate it. And as a result, as well as these little bits of food they were given, it is written that sometimes these poorer members of the community were given a loaf of bread or a cheese with a piece of money placed inside it as a reward for their hard work, and then a cup of drink was presented, and the receiver was required to drink a little of it immediately as, as a, a toast, as it were, over the body. And just to wrap up this initial bit about funeral customs, we do have a quote from a Reverend E. L. Barnwell, and he said in the late 19th century, Although this custom is no longer in fashion, yet it is to some extent represented by the practice, especially in funerals of a higher class, to hand to those who are invited to attend the funeral oblong sponge cakes sealed in a paper, which each one puts in his or her pocket. But the providing and distribution of these cakes are now often part of the undertaker's duty. So, in conclusion for this section, yes, there was lots of beer going on, and people were given oblong sponge cakes. There was... There was Funeral cake, I guess you could call it, given away at the time. Now, that's the cheerful, macabre section out of the way. Let's get back to beer, real beer drinking, the national drink of Wales. And you might be asking, why is beer the national drink of Wales? Well, I, I don't know is the honest answer. But there's lots of possible reasons, and I guess it's quite a simplistic one, but it could simply be the fact that Welsh people do appear to love their beer. A bit like French people love wine. You know, I don't know if there is a national drink of France or not, but if there is, I assume it is wine. It could just be a similar stereotype with Wales. Although, as a proud Welshman, it does pain me to say that given the choice, I would much rather a glass of French red wine over a pint of beer, but don't 
t- tell anyone. But anyway, back to beer. It's the national drink. And one of the earliest references we have to a beer-like drink is connected to the tales of Caridwen. Now, fans of folklore, of the Mabinogion, of old Welsh tales will be familiar with the name Caridwen, as will modern-day pagans. Caridwen is a wonderful character, a, a, a witch, an enchantress, a, a goddess to some, who has evolved and changed over time. But while she might mean many things to many people and has continued to grow over the years, for the sake of our story, we are going right back through the centuries when Caridwen, one of Wales's finest practitioners of magic, would create her powerful potions in a cauldron called Awen, A-W-E-N. Now, Caridwen, and oh, I, I should spell her name quickly as well for you, and there are some variations out there. The standard version would be Caridwen, C-E-R-I-D-W-E-N, Caridwen. And it's also spelt with a double R occasionally as well, C-E-R-R-I-D-W-E-N. But as this is audio only, it does I can spell it any way I want, really, as long as you can understand my pronunciation of it. So Caridwen is this this enchantress from legend. And I'm not going to dwell too much on Caridwen now because I, I hate to keep saying this, but Caridwen really is an episode to herself. So Caridwen I will come back to and look at in much more depth. But possibly the most famous tale to involve Caridwen is the origin story of the poet Taliesin. Now, Taliesin is one of, if not the most well-known characters in these old Welsh myths and legends. And what is particularly fascinating about Taliesin is that his origin story combines both fact and fiction. Taliesin was certainly a real person, a real poet, a bard, and his works still survive to this day. But the tale of how he came to become such an incredible man of words, how he composed these incredible verses, isn't the most uh, realistic story, shall we say. I think no matter how open-minded you are, I, I, it would take a big leap to think that this is how Taliesin really got his power. But nevertheless, I'll tell you the story and you can make up your own mind if you would like to believe this story or not. And apologies to do this a second time again so quickly, but as with Caridwen, Taliesin is such a huge, important character in, in in Welsh culture, not just in the myths and the legends and the folklore, that I will be dedicating at least one episode of this podcast to look at Taliesin's life in more detail later on. But for the sake of this episode, what we need to know is that the tale of Taliesin begins, the fantastical tale begins, with Caridwen looking to make a potion for her son, a magical potion, because she considered, or her, his parents considered, that he was not clever enough to get ahead in this world. They also, as an aside, thought he was a bit ugly, uh, which is a bit harsh, but by all accounts, back then, you either had to be good-looking or you had to be smart to succeed. He had neither going in his favour, and Caridwen decided the easiest one to fix would be his brain. So she set about preparing a potion which would grant him incredible powers of wisdom and knowledge. This potion would make him the, the cleverest, brainiest person on the planet. Now, in order to make this potion, she would need some help. This was effectively a three-person job. While she was busy out and about gathering the ingredients daily or however often it needed to be topped up, she would need two other people to watch it. And the one that concerns us is the person that she drafted in effectively as a slave. But she got this person to go in and to stir 
that potion to stir the liquid in the cauldron each and every day. And the name of that person was young Guion Bach, little Guion. And Guion was stirring this potion and it took 12 months of stirring, an entire year of stirring. And it was on the final day, just as Caridwen's plans were coming to fruition. And it was going to be passed on to Caridwen's son to make him Mr. Brainy that something went wrong. All it would take is three drops of this incredibly potent potion to have an effect. And as Guion was stirring on that final, final day, three drops splashed out of the cauldron and onto his hand. Now, Caridwen had not told him the real reason he was stirring this. He had no idea how powerful this would be. He licked the three drops from his hand, and as a result, he benefited from all that knowledge and wisdom which was destined for somebody else. He claimed it for himself by mistake. And to cut a long story short, spoiler alert, but he becomes Taliesin as a result of all of this. But this is only half the story. Because when Caridwen finds out what has happened, there is a bonkers cat and mouse chase where they both start transforming into different animals and things. But for the sake of our story, all that's important to know is that Young Guion, young Guion Bach had messed up Caridwen's plans and had drunken that potion himself. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story in a podcast about beer, and things, things do get kind of confusing, and this is why I do need extra episodes to look at these things in more depth, but for the sake of this episode, what we need to know is that Taliesin, as mentioned, was a real person even if he had a fictional origin story. And in poems attributed to Taliesin, the 6th century bard, he mentions a drink. It is a drink which was enjoyed by the Druids all those centuries ago. And this drink, so it is said, originated in the cauldron of Caridwen. Now, when that potion was made, which transformed little Guion Bach into Tally Essen, and he took those three drops, the remainder turned to poison. But by purifying that poison, or whatever concoction she was working on, they could then create a new drink, and that was called Gwyn R. Bragaud. Now, Gwyn. The first word will be familiar to modern-day Welsh speakers as the word for wine. Wine, gwyn, ah, and wine, and this, this other word, bragout. Well, bragout is the reason I am telling you the tale of Taliesin, because we know that there was a real drink by this name. And if the first known reference that we have to this word, meaning mead, can be traced back to Caridwen, then we could say beer was invented in Wales in the cauldron of a witch, possibly. And maybe that is why it is the national drink of Wales, because we love our beer and we love our witches. But to the description of this beery-like drink, now, there is a description from the 9th century. And apparently, in inverted commas, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it was a popular drink in Wales. More specifically, not just any old drink. It was said to be a distinctive blend of Welsh ale, a potent concoction at the time. Even back then, Welsh beer was known to have the um, the skull attack <laughs> effect, which is a, uh, I'm going off on a quick tangent here, but that's a nickname for one of the, uh, the most popular Welsh brands of beer is Brains Beer, and one of their more powerful varieties is S.A. Brains. Now, S.A. Brains is just the name of the founder of the company. It's his initials, Samuel Arthur Brain. But 
it has become better known as Skull Attack because of its morning after effects, uh, shall we say. So when you ask for a pint of Brains S.A., you are effectively asking for a pint of Brains Skull Attack. But back to the brag out, and it was in the 9th century known as a potent concoction often overloaded with spices and honey, and this distinctive blend of this ale tasted like a cross between mead and modern-day ale. All of which sounds quite uh, tasty, really. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind a glass myself. I'd swap, I'd swap my French wine for a taste. Now, this, this concoction was made by the monks in the monasteries, and it was considered to be superior to all other ales until that big killjoy, Henry VIII, came along with his dissolution of the monasteries and put an end to such things in the 16th century. So not only did Henry VIII destroy all of those priceless works of art and those incredible religious buildings and all the other damage that went with it, he also put an end to what has been described as possibly the best beer in Britain, if not the best beer in in the world, we, we will never know because we will never taste it, I guess. But if you were listening to the last episode of this about the fairies, there was a little, I, I don't know if it was meant as a joke or not, but apparently the decline in fairy sightings in Neath, which was their, their stronghold towards the end of fairy sightings in the 19th century, is blamed on the Methodists because apparently the Methodists, with their own brand of Christianity, were strict teetotalers. And as such, this movement put a dampener on people drinking. As a result, people stopped seeing fairies. I, whether there's a connection there or not, I do not know. But the history of beer, which had been ticking along so nicely, was rudely shaken up by Henry VIII. And then centuries later, religion and the whole temperance movement would once again mess things up for beer drinkers. The good news for modern day beer drinkers though, is that things are much better now. And there are quite a few Welsh companies out there now, and I'm not gonna start randomly name dropping beer companies and giving free <laughs> adverts and things out to people, but there is one company in particular I think is appropriate for this podcast because they combine beer with folklore. I know, you almost couldn't make it up really. I mean, this is an episode about beer and folklore in Wales, and there is a company that makes beer inspired by folklore in Wales, and they are called Avon Male Meadery, based in Newquay in Ceredigion. And it's, I love how these things come together, but I was tweeting about the Gwithki, the Welsh dog of darkness, this mysterious four-legged creature which stalks the lonely lanes at night, which you can hear all about in episode seven of this podcast. If you want to go back and listen to the stories about the, the Welsh hound of hell after listening to this one, but I was tweeting about the Gwithki, and that is how I crossed paths with Avon Mill. Because as it happened, they were making a new drink, which had, well, a creature which looked a heck of a lot like the Gwithki on the label. And since then, we've been in touch, and they like to name their drinks after Welsh folklore and after myths and legends. And they sent me a bottle with the Gwithki on it, and it was incredible because mead to me, when, when I think of mead, it sounds like one of those sort of really old drinks that Vikings might drink and is very not good for you or something. But honey mead is it's sparkling and light. And there you go. I thought that's such a great, great combination. And that is the end of me plugging any beer companies. Back to the story. There's one quirky little bit of, I, I don't know if this qualifies as folklore or not, because th there is an argument that this could actually be true. But there is a claim that Guinness Ireland's most famous drink, Ireland's black gold, which was, by all accounts, invented by Arthur Guinness. Well, there is 
an argument, and I don't want to upset any of my Irish listeners, but there is an argument that that was also invented in Wales. It was back in the 18th century when Arthur Guinness was travelling across Britain. And if you wanted to get back and forth between Ireland and, and England, say, Wales was that big lump in between, and you had to go via Hollyhead. Now, as he was travelling back towards Hollyhead, he popped into a tavern in Llanfairwachan, which is near Bangor, and they served a particularly tasty variety of drink, which, if the story is correct, had a secret recipe, and the name of this establishment was Gween D. Now, Gween is a word we encountered earlier in Caridwen's concoction in her cauldron, which means wine. The other word, D, means black. And put together and translated, Gween D means black wine. And it is said this black wine was made from this secret recipe, and that is the Guinness we know and love today. Now, that account has been taken from more recent news articles and news websites, and the idea was put forward by a historian in the area. I don't personally know if it's true or not, and if it has upset any of my Irish friends, I apologise in advance and let's move on quickly. What I'd like to do is to wrap things up with a few little bits of folklore, which, unlike the Guinness story, may or may not be, these are bits of folklore because they were published in a book entitled Folklore of Wales. It's one of my favourite books of Welsh folklore, which dates from the turn of the 20th century. This really does capture that sort of Edwardian looking towards the future and yet recording some of these traditions from the Victorian period and much, much further back. And one of these snippets of folklore claims that rosemary, the plant rosemary, was regarded as an excellent remedy against chronic drunken habits. Now, I'm taking this to mean it was a great sort of preventative measure from becoming drunk, from being tipsy. And in order for its power to work, an infusion of it was often put in the cask or measure of beer. By all accounts, it also kept beer from turning sour. So if you want to avoid getting too drunk, maybe it's a a wedding or something and you'll be drinking all day. Drop some rosemary into your beer. Now, this next piece of beer folklore I absolutely love. And what I particularly like about this one is that while it, it hasn't been specified, much of this beer folklore is very masculine. It's very blokey. It's It is assumed it is the men drinking the beer, not women. As with the example with the funeral, where the men drink the beer and smoke, the women have a nice cup of tea. But that was not always the case. And there's a lovely little piece of folklore where it is said that it was formerly the custom in Wales to make a large, rich cheese for luck, in readiness for the expected birth of the first child. So if there's a child on the way, a big rich cheese is made. But it was made in secret. Not a man was allowed to know of it, especially the husband. When the gossips congregated at the birth, and the husband invited the women to take refreshment, presumably a cup of tea, they stolidly refused. But the moment his back was turned, out came the cheese and beer. So in Wales, in former times, when a woman gave birth, the women would get together. They'd wait for the men to get out of the way and they'd crack open the cheese and the beer, which to me sounds like the ideal party. Now, part of the cheese was eaten and the remainder was divided among the women who were expected to take their portions home. All of this was done secretly for the sake of good luck and the prosperity of of mother and infant. And I think that that needs to be revived, doesn't it? Although saying that, as as a man, maybe it is still going on, and I don't know, because the whole point 
is to, is to keep it secret from men. So maybe maybe there's cheese and beer parties going on non-stop, and, and I just haven't noticed. I don't know. But anyway, with beer, there is so much more to go into. As I mentioned, it is considered to be the national drink of Wales, and as such, it crops up. It plays a big part. Uh, well, drinking plays a big part in the Mary Lloyd festivities at Christmas, as it does with most Saints' Days, as it does with All Hallows' Eve, and beer just crops up again and again and again and again, and I think beer is going to be referenced to a lot in the upcoming episodes, in the upcoming years that I continue to do this podcast, and if there is one thing in particular that I was not able to include in this episode that I will certainly be going back to in more detail is that while we did touch upon this connection between drinking beer and funerals, this quite dark Welsh tradition of alcohol and saying our last goodbyes goes much, much deeper than just having a pint at a funeral. Because we have yet to meet a particular character, an eerie, feared, despised, and some might say misunderstood character. And that is the Sin Eater. The Sin Eater, the outcast whose job it was to take the sins from the dead into themselves and as a result to become the most sinful person in the parish. And they took these sins from the dead before they were placed into the ground by eating food placed on their coffins and drinking beer over their dead bodies. And on that cheerful note, it it leads me very nicely into that point of the episode where I ask what you think. If you have any thoughts, ideas of your own, on any of these strange customs we've spoken about, whether it be the connection with the funerals, whether it be Caridwen the witch and her magical cauldron. As always, please get in touch. It's always great to hear from anyone and everyone, even if it's just to say hello. And you can track me down on social media. I'm on all the main social media sites. Just do a search for Mark Race. Put the word ghosts in or folklore. I'll pop up on the top. You can email me via the website. Or what would be nice is you could always leave a nice review. Well, you can leave any review, but a nice one would be would be better on whatever podcast site you use to listen to this. So if you're on Apple or you're on Spotify or any of the other fantastic sites this is available on, if you wanted to leave me a thumbs up and a lovely review, that would be very much appreciated. And that does lead me into my cheeky and regular little request that if you have enjoyed this podcast, please consider hitting the subscribe button because it does make a big difference to me knowing people are listening and it means you will never miss an episode ever. So all of those upcoming episodes about the Mary Lloyd and about the Sin Eater and about Caridwen and about Taliesin. You will not miss any of them if you hit the subscribe button. And after all that talk about beer, I don't know about you, but I'm quite thirsty now, so I'm going to see if there is any beer amongst my bottles of French wine. And you are all welcome to join me, uh, assuming it's legal and safe and all, the, all, you know, don't don't get me in trouble if you are operating heavy machinery or driving a school bus or something. Do not drink beer. But if, if you're sitting at home, if you're sitting in a pub, then, well, you're probably drinking beer anyway. But if it is safe to do so and you are not underage or anything silly, crack open a beer, hold it up in the air, and we can all say together... Cheers, Yechida, and Clathi Amaru Ak At Akuru to bury the dead and to the beer. Thank you very much for listening. Dioch Varian Grando, I've been Mark Reese. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best, it's the beautiful, it's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, Prost, Salou, and Bottoms Up!
Just det. 